So with all that said, uh, let me just say thank you for being a part of our community, for uh, logging on tonight, for uh, uh, jumping over hurdles of passwords and uh, things like that. And, uh, you know, we really hope that you will participate not only in the polls, but also in asking the questions, uh, because that will help us to uh, to know what it is that uh, that we can do to help, and also, of course, uh, you know what it is that you might want us to program in the future. So, um, you know, as we all look towards the the new normal that we're going to be dealing with for quite a while to come, uh, this sort of interactivity is important. So uh, I think it is time for me to uh, uh, wind down and to uh, offer up uh, the, uh, the, the floor to Sean McCabe from Takeda uh, as uh, uh, one of our sponsors for a quick word. Sean? Thank you very much. I think I'm unmuted, right? Um, so uh, welcome everyone. Honored to be here and honored to serve uh, as the immune deficiency uh, franchise lead at Takeda. Um, and with that in mind, just uh, looking forward to the opportunity as best able to converse with all of you in our breakout. A lot of common questions. Uh, our plasma centers are open. Our, our manufacturing plants remain open throughout the, this very unique dynamic. Um, but a, a very special thanks to John and the IDF for adapting so quickly to the needs of the community in this virtual environment, along with the HCPs who are here presenting tonight not only in servicing the community, but relaying uh, really you know, timely and relevant content. Um, so looking forward, obviously, to the breakouts and just a, a quick, I guess, recognition. I know I have an industry peer here in CSL, very proud of the alliance that we've also formed to, be, to build scale and um, scope to uh, also trying to look for solutions for this uh, COVID disease. So really proud to be a part of all this and, and looking forward to speaking with you. I'll be joined in the breakout with Dana Flathammer, who is the head of our patient community support team and leads my IG source. Thank you. Thank you, Sean, for your words, and thank you, John, for your wonderful welcome. Now, I do want to share a quick disclaimer before we begin our medical presentations. IDF understands that COVID, the COVID-19 pandemic is a rapidly evolving situation. So we encourage you to check our website often for updates. Also, please remember the information presented during this event is not medical advice and is not intended to be a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Rather, we're here today as a trusted source and friend to provide you with information that can be used to help understand the current situation we are in. So our first presenter is um, Dr. Roger Kobayashi. Dr. Kobayashi is a clinical professor of pediatrics at UCLA School of Medicine in Los Angeles. He sees patients at Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology Associates in Omaha, and he will present a short overview of COVID-19 titled Enemy at Our Gates. If, excuse me, thank you very much. And uh, this was slapped on at the last minute. Dr. Bob Penn will be giving a full lecture on COVID on Mar uh, May 30th. So what I'd like to do is really give you a little background about COVID. You've probably heard and read a lot about it. And uh, this slide talks about what COVID viruses are and what it is in a nutshell. Viruses, there are billions and billions of viruses. In fact, people have said that there are more viruses on this earth than there are stars in our universe. So there are quite a bit of them. And most of the time, they're very helpful and they don't cause harm. They infect plants, animals, and even bacteria. And it is only once in a while that they, in fact, infect us. And they are very, they're primitive. So they cannot reproduce themselves. So what they need is another live cell or live organism. And unfortunately, COVID chose us. But they've been around for about 55 million years. There are two big kinds of viruses. One is RNA. These are sim the simplest of the lot. And the other one is DNA. And there's, an there's another way we categorize them. They're enveloped and unenveloped. And I think this is important because COVID virus happens to be an envelope virus. And this is a big advantage because what happens is the envelope, which is a fat or lipid envelope, can be destroyed by detergents, by sunlight, 
by heat, by alcohol, by Clorox or bleach, and a number of other things. So this in itself is very helpful. The unenveloped viruses are very tough cookies and they're hard to get rid of. So that's one advantage because one of the things I like to talk about is the interaction between the environment, the virus, and the host, which is us. And the RNA virus is really the stripped down Volkswagen model without any of the bells and whistles. This is certainly not the Mercedes Benz. Commonly, the RNA, R, RNA viruses cause the common cold. COVID, uh, the coronaviruses in the what we knew of them in the past was cold viruses, but there's some bad boys in the family, including rabies, Ebola, influenza is an RNA virus, measles, polio, West Nile, and a number of others. Now, interestingly enough, coronavirus was found in our backyard and South Dakota, North Dakota to be specific. And what happened was in 1931, coronavirus infected chickens in, the, in uh, North Dakota. And if you can imagine, between 40 and 90% of all chicks died. And nobody paid attention to them again until the 1960s, when both in Great Britain and in the United States, human coronavirus was found. And I hate to tell you, I started medical school in 1969. And back then we knew about coronavirus and everybody said, don't worry about it. It causes a common cold, not important. Well, there was not as much excitement until 2002 when we saw SARS or 2003, 2012 with MERS, and now with COVID-19. These are, if you will, coronaviruses. And there is a famous Sun Tzu who wrote The Art of War. And what he says, you have to know your enemy and you know yourself. And if you don't know one or the other, or if you don't know both, then you're in big trouble. You're going to lose all the battles. And the point here is that we have to understand the virus and we have to understand ourselves. And we'll talk a little bit more about this in the third lecture. Some of the characteristics of the coronavirus, it's an envelope. So you can see on the picture, I don't, I don't know if you can see it, but the double S, that's the lipid that protects the DNA, the, I mean the RNA. The RNA is a message. It's like a ticker tape or a tape that tells the virus or tells the cell what to make. So it's that stuff inside, again, you can't see it, but the stuff that's inside that double S that transforms the message so that our cells make more of the viruses. And most people, the problem with this uh, virus is that number one, it's highly contagious. And this is the problem. In, the, in, the, in SARS and MERS, it was not as contagious. Here it is one, very contagious. Number two, we don't know who has it. And all of us, all seven billion of us, do not have immunity to this virus. It is completely new. And so this is the problem. And the other thing is most of us do not get sick. So people who may be walking around, coming into contact with us, may be carrying the virus. It's not like chicken pox or measles where you see a rash and you know right away, stay away from this person. There's no way to tell with this. The other thing is that it goes after the heart and lungs and it's due to the ACE2 receptor. And these are, that we have a lot of this in the respiratory tract and the lung. That in itself is helpful because of what the virus needs to do is it needs to come in and it needs to be able to attach to something. And if it cannot attach, and that's why most viruses don't jump to us because they can't attach to our cells. What happened was this virus mutated and it developed the ability to attach to our cells, in this case, these receptors that you see. So what is the disadvantage? It can attach to our cells what is the way we can fight this thing? We can block its ability to attach in a number of ways. So in addition to the heart and lungs, which have tons of ACE2 receptors, it also affects the kidneys, the blood vessels, clotting, and it can cause the immune system, which normally would respond in a correct fashion, attack the invading microorganism, not damage surrounding tissue, and allow the thing to heal when we get rid of the infection. Sometimes the immune system over responds. And in the case of COVID virus, there are some individuals who have this catastrophic release of inflammatory mediators, which then damage our lungs, our heart, our kidneys, and our liver. 
And this is one of the problems. It also causes inflammation in the blood vessel. And some of you have heard now that there is a Kawasaki-like syndrome in children, which is a vasculitis uh, that affects the skin, can affect the heart and other organisms. So the question is, we have noticed very early on, I remember having dinner with a bunch of people and they're asking, how come uh, women don't get as sick as men? How come children don't seem to get as sick uh, as adults? How come old people get sick much more severely? And why do fat men seem to have problems? So if you're a sumo wrestler, you're in trouble. So one of the things about young children is that their immune system is different. And interestingly enough, their ability to release cytokines seem to be less than older individuals. The other thing is that there are precedences in disease, measles, chicken pox, infectious mononucleosis in children are very mild diseases for the most part. If you have measles or chicken pox in an adult, it is sometimes a catastrophic disease. In fact, two of the sickest people I took off, or two of some of the sickest people I took, off, took care of as an intern were adults who had measles. He was in coma for a month. And a person with chicken pox, an adult with chicken pox, where he had bleeding all over, inflammation in the brain and whatnot. And many times in children, uh, chicken pox is an inconvenience. So the children's immune system is a little different. Old people is a, I'm a pediatrician, but I've become very interested in geriatric uh, immune deficiency. And what happens is that old people, like their heart, like their joints, like their kidneys and everything else, their immune system wears off. And there's a lot of research on this. But what happens is that they have immunosciences. What happens is their immune system doesn't respond as well, or it makes a lot of mistakes. And so this is a big problem. It's like you have an old person who really shouldn't be driving. And their immune system is like that. It doesn't respond well to infections. They don't respond well. It takes old people a long time to get rid of viruses. Their T cells numbers go down, and their T cells don't work. And as a result, they get sicker, and on top of that, they have a number of other health issues which compound the problem. Why do men get sicker more than women? Well, I think there are several possible reasons, all of which are speculation but not proven. One is that men may have more heart disease. Number two, men take more chances. Number three, women's immune system is better. Uh, there, there is a thought that the two X chromosomes that the women have, the X chromosomes have, uh, many of the immune genes may be better. Uh, they think that estrogens may be protective, and there are mouse models for that. Uh, and then men get rid of coronavirus much more slowly. And then if you're fat, that's not good. So in, in, in the final slide, slides, we would want to say that there's really three components. There's the environment. There are the cells. It's too bad we don't have a pointer. The virus itself, and then us. So what about the environment? Well, obviously, public health and quarantine measures are absolutely essential. And this has been how we have fought infections for thousands of years. And right now, this is the most effective way we have. It's an absolute requirement that we have accurate and large-scale testing. And unfortunately, we don't have this. And this is the problem. We don't know who's sick, who's caring, who's immune. How are we going to eventually fight this infection or this problem? It's by the buildup of immunity or acquired immunity in the population. I'll talk about that in the talk three. We absolutely need to understand this virus, its characteristics, its behavior, its structure, how it causes infections in certain individuals, and what is its, what is its uh, vulnerabilities. And finally, we have to know about our, ourselves. Why is it that children don't get sick? Is there something about their immune system that we can learn? Why is it that women don't seem to get as sick? Is there something about boosting the immunity, about estrogen, about receptors? I mean, these are all these kinds of things that we have to learn about and hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll get. This is my favorite slide. And I have to tell you, I married to a woman, uh, I forgot what they're called now. <laughs> Kathy, you gotta help me women livers or whatever they were called back in the 60s, power to the women. And I love this slide because my mother was one of the few who went to work in the 1950s. So we can do it. And so I'd like to thank, uh, I'd like to thank the IDF. Uh, I hate to tell uh, Jeff, but I, I may have been associated with the IDF before he was born. 
his mother found the IDF in 1980, and I went on board uh, in 1982. So I'd like to thank the IDF and the sponsors of this program. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kobayashi. Our next presenter is Dr. Hannah Niebuhr. Dr. Niebuhr is an assistant professor in the Division of Pediatric Allergy and Immunology at the University of Nebraska College of Medicine and sees patients at Children's Hospital and Medical Center in Omaha. She will present information about treatment and precautions for the PI community. Hi everyone, thank you for having me. Uh, this is an interesting topic because, uh, you know, as with everything else, we're, we are still learning a lot as we go. So the general precautions, and these have been pretty well disseminated, though not everyone is following them. So first up is social distancing. The idea isn't that you are... So this isn't needed within your household as long as the members within your household are well. We shouldn't be going out unless we absolutely need to. And so absolutely need to really needs to be thought of clearly. So things like groceries, doctor's appointment, you know, it's not for get togethers and things like that. And those are things we should be avoiding. Crowded places, large gatherings. And with the goal of when you do actually have to go out in public, you should stay six feet apart from others. Some places are really trying to adapt, like some of the grocery stores are having directions for the way you walk to try and help with, with um, social distancing as much as possible. Uh, hand washing is really, really, really important. And a, soap and water is best, but hand sanitizer with at least 60% alcohol also works well. When you should you be washing your hands? All the time. So anytime after being out in public, you should wash your hands, and especially before and after touching your face. If you are one of those people who frequently touches your face, touches your glasses, touches your hair, you end up doing a lot of hand washing. So there are also some work on habits there as well. There are a lot of questions if gloves are helpful, and honestly, I don't think they are. Gloves help avoid contamination. So if you were touching something and you would want to avoid spreading it to something else, they help very well. But if you are trying to avoid contaminating yourself, you're probably better off just being very diligent with hand washing. We also have to be very cautious with anything that causes, air, causes aerosolization. So anything that causes more respiratory droplets to dissolve in the air. So nebulizer treatments are a big one, especially for anyone who has asthma. Singing is another one, which might be why there are so many reports of choirs where multiple people are getting ill, and of course sneezing. Cleaning frequently touched surfaces daily is also going to be important. For this, you do want to either use soap and water or a bleach-based cleanser. So things like doorknobs, um, phones, keys, Think about all these things that we touch all day long without really thinking about it. And again, inside the home, not as important, but when you're leaving to go places, it becomes much more important. So, you know, there are so many things that we cannot control about this. And so I do find it helpful to focus on the things we can do to keep ourselves healthy. And these include healthy habits, and a lot of these sound like the advice our mothers and grandmothers have always given us, but it is good advice. So hydration is very important. Make sure you are drinking enough water. Rest is also important, and sometimes when you are stressed and anxious, getting that rest is hard. But having a good sleep schedule is going to be important. Nutrition is also very important, keeping a healthy, balanced diet. Exercise is also helpful. You know, a lot of us maybe have more times on our hands these days because we are not as busy as we used to be. And so using some of that time to exercise is important. You know, while we're talking about avoiding going out of the house and avoiding contact with others, that doesn't include things as simple as a walk outside. Yes, a lot of parks and playgrounds are closed, but, uh, you know, going for a walk outside is, is a good idea. And I will add not smoking, or if you're thinking about stopping smoking, this is a good time to do it. This is primarily a lung disease, and smoking really does impact our ability to fight respiratory viral infections. 
Stress and anxiety management is also something we should really be talking about. In a time when we are, you know, trying to isolate ourselves at home, we still need to keep connected to others. And as this goes on and on, we have to be really thoughtful about ways to do that in which it makes sense. Ways to keep our own risk down, but not feel alone in this. Keeping busy is also important. If you haven't had a time to find hobbies or you need to find a new way to enjoy your hobbies, then find a new way. Finding ways to manage stress are also important. Sometimes it's calming exercises or meditation. Some people find yoga helpful. Sometimes it's as simple as just closing your eyes and focusing on breathing in and breathing out. A lot of what we consume in news and social media can also add to our stress and anxiety. A lot of what we read tends to be very sensational. And having that calm middle voice to listen to is important. So I think it's, we have to be very cognizant of where we get our information. Masks are also definitely helpful, especially if we do this on large scale society. It seems to be much more helpful in, pre in prevent keeping others healthy. So when you wear your mask, it keeps you from infecting others. It doesn't necessarily protect you from others. So this only works well if we all do it. So when you're looking for a mask and it, figuring out if it fits right or not, you sh it should cover your nose and mouth, fit fairly closely against the side of your face and go down to your chin. It should be secured with either ties or ear loops and more than one layer is preferred, which is why if you're wearing a homemade single layer mask, some of you've seen some of the recommendations about covering it up with a bandana. You should wash it when soiled at least once daily. There are also some options for sanitizing it with um, alcohol as well. So what can go wrong with masks? So these are all the different things that could indicate that your mask is not working correctly. So this first picture, it's not covering the nose. The second one, someone is taking a break from wearing their mask. If you wanna take a break, go someplace by yourself and take it off all the way because if you're pulling it down like that, you risk contaminating your mask. Our next picture shows a not great fit on the sides. Um, the First picture on the bottom row shows a mask that is too small, as in it's covering the nose and the mouth, but not all the way down to the chin. And then this next picture shows a mask that is, again, too small, not really covering the sides. And last but not least, Batman, whose mask does protect his identity, but will not protect him from COVID-19. So how do we get a mask? Well, you can make your own. There are tons of videos and tutorials available, and some of them do not involve sewing if that is not your thing. Uh, the picture here is from the CDC that shows a no, um, a no sew option for making masks. But I will say, if you go on the internet, there are all kinds of things people are making masks from, everything from socks to, to um to bras. And so there are certainly going to be options out there for you. There, and if you are not able to do any of those things, there are lots of people out there in, communi in the community who are looking for ways to help. And so I would contact your community resources, I would contact your hospitals, your medical clinics, and see if they have additional resources to share with you. So what do we do for mild to moderate diseases? Dr. Kobayashi mentioned, you know, most people are not gonna get too sick. And for those that 80% of people, they should rest at home and they really should avoid contact with household members. Now, while it's ideal for you know, them to stay somewhere else entirely, that's not always possible. So if that was, you have someone in your home who is sick, they should stay in their bedroom. They should only come out to use the bathroom. They should preferably use a separate bathroom. If they can't use a separate bathroom, it should be cleaned down between uses. And all household members should quarantine to limit spread. And we'll talk about what quarantine exactly means in a little bit. Again, hydration is very important. In anything involving inflammation, you can minimize some of the side effects with hydration. You also have to keep an eye out for worsening symptoms or complications. And again, most people are sick for a week before it becomes clear if they are going to get worse or if they're just going to slowly get better. And so the things to watch out for are breathing problems, shortness of breath, 
difficulty breathing, especially if you're having trouble just walking or talking. You start having chest pain. A lot of people have had complications involving their heart, and that can include symptoms of heart attack. And last but not least, stroke symptoms. So one-sided weakness, confusion, drooping, things like that. So what does home isolation mean? So for the CDC guidelines, it's suggested that 10 days after symptom onset and three days after your symptoms are improving. So no fevers and everything else is getting better. Now, immunocompromised people are at risk for shedding longer simply because the recovery is longer. So the CDC suggests that, that again, 10 and three, so 10 days after symptoms started and three days after symptoms are improving. And they also recommend two negative tests collected 24 hours apart. Test Nebraska is offering testing and availability is improving. It's not perfect, but it is certainly improving as things go on. And so if you are having trouble accessing testing and you think you need to be tested, I would suggest contacting your doctor to see what, how they can help you. Nebraska Medicine's guidelines are slightly different. They recommend 10 days after some symptom onset and five days after symptoms of sighting, so 10 and five. For immunocompromised patients, they recommend 14 days after symptom onset and seven days after symptoms are subsiding. Again, simply because that viral shedding and risk of transmitting disease to others can last longer if it takes you longer to clear the infection. So for moderate to severe disease, people need to be in the hospital. And a lot of studies are showing early interventions might be better. So don't wait. In our region, we still have plenty of ICUs and hospital space available. A lot of people need to just start with supportive care, and that includes oxygen, preferably non-invasive oxygen. So not oxygen with a breathing tube, oxygen with nasal clips or a face mask. IV hydration, because a lot of people are having trouble drinking when they're having trouble breathing. Monitoring of blood pressure and also monitoring for vascular and heart disease and those complications. There are, is a lot of talk about investigational treatment, and the IDF website does have a couple excellent talks by Dr. Sullivan that I would recommend taking a look at for further information. Um, probably the medication that we have heard the most about is remdesivir. Emergency use was authorized by the FDA after a, a short randomized control trial, but there are some additional studies ongoing to look at it in combination with other medications. There is a clinical trial available in Nebraska. The other medications that are under evaluation are inhibitors of inflammation. Again, the, a lot of the complications seem to be because of the immune response, the inflammation that occurs while people are trying to get the infection under control. So there are some questions if you use medications that block that pathway of inflammation, can you prevent the complications? Can you prevent death? Uh, Dr. Kobayashi mentioned convalescent plasma, so I'll skip over that for now. Vaccine development is another thing that is under investigation, you know, but I would say that it, it would be very surprising if this is available in a year. Vaccine development, especially to prove that it works in a safe, typically takes a few years. So we'll have to see what happens. A lot of medications were kind of investigated and these studies are hard to do. Now the best studies are one where, which have a lot of people involved and have two groups, one group that gets treated and one group that doesn't, and making sure those two groups are very comparable to each other. So a lot of these were talked about because they were done at one place just on the sickest of the sick people and there was no comparison group. But as people have started to do larger studies with those comparison groups, it's looking like most of these listed don't really help. And some of them have some pretty significant side effects, and that includes azithromycin, chloroquine, and hydroxychloroquine, lopinavir and ritonavir, steroids, and uh, favipiravir. Uh, so I will be around for questions later, and I will turn it back over to Kathy. Thank you so much, Dr. Niebuhr. 
Now, please join me in welcoming back Dr. Kobayashi. He will present about IP therapy now and after COVID-19. Okay, thank you. And uh, Hannah, that was an excellent review. Um, what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about passive immunity, but also a little bit about active immunity to give you a background. Uh, what I'm going to do is uh, I, I sent the slide and then I sent the revision on Monday and there are a couple of other slides and it's missing. So what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm dual screening here. And what I have as the next slide before this one was focus answers. My discussion will provide background, but the main point is that it is important for you to continue your gamma globulin treatment. For most of you in the audience, you have hypogamma globulinemia. What that means is you have low antibodies and they probably don't work. And so gamma globulin is life saving. And so you need to continue that. There was a question about the safety. Does IG therapy prevent me from getting COVID-19? How long will it be before antibodies to COVID-19 are in IgG products? The answer to the first part, can IVIG or IG protect me? The answer is maybe it's much more complicated and we'll address that in the question and answer period. I have to make a disclosure. I am consulting to, I'm a consultant to Octa Pharma on passive immunity for both their hyperimmune plasma and for their, there's a consortium with Takeda and others and Octa Pharma is part of that and they're putting together a hyperimmune IgG against COVID. So I have to make that disclosure. So the question is how long will it be until we have antibodies to COVID-19 in Ig products? It'll take at least six months or more. Safety again, can I get COVID-19 from my Ig therapy? The answer is absolutely not. We are now on the fourth generation product, so it is much, much safer. And the thing, remember, I told you about envelope uh, viruses. So now it's detergent treated, so we get rid of the envelope viruses very nicely. We heat them up by pasteurization. We also treat them by filtration and other methods. So the chance of getting an infection in the IVIG is next to nil, including mad cow disease. The next question was, what about shortage? And I'm gonna let John uh, answer this more, but there is a shortage. John announced a shortage back in January 2019. The FDA in August 12 of 2019 officially recognized that there was a shortage. And there's a number of reasons for that uh, that we can discuss again uh, in, the, in the question and answer. Is there anything I should do now to prepare for the shortage of immunoglobulin? If there's a shortage, what should I do? And the answer is contact a prescribing doctor for sure. Uh, contact the IDF, which has been instrumental in helping to make sure products are available. Contact the manufacturer and contact the, the uh, provider of the product and supplies. And then finally, this is an interesting question and I'll let Hannah, if Hannah's still on the line, uh, she can answer this in the question and answer uh, period. But the question is safety currently in place. And the issue is, you know, is it safe to go to the hospital? Is it safe to go to the infusion centers? Is it safe to have an infusion nurse come to my home? And I think that there are many precautions that are being taken. But the point is, the more you come into exposure in different environments, the more you increase your risk. So this is something you have to talk with your immunologist or with your primary care provider. So now we can get to the slide. And this is a critical slide. This is very important. As Kathy well knows, I love history. And the thing is that we build, uh, we stand on the shoulder of giants. And the idea of active and passive immunity is not new. And I'll go on to talk about how we're applying these very old principles to now. Back in, back in 1796, Sir Edward Jenner gave smallpox vaccine. And what it did, it protected against a devastating disease. You have no idea how how devastating smallpox was. In the old days, in susceptible populations, it killed 90% of people. And that's why the eradication of smallpox by vaccination is really one of the milestones of medicine. And then for those who have grandparents who remember, polio was a devastating disease. People were more afraid of polio than they are of COVID virus. And so when Jonas Salk back in the late 40s and early 50s developed the vaccine, polio vaccine, 
This prevented paralytic polio, so we do not see polio in the United States, and we have virtually wiped out polio from the rest of the world. And here you can see a brave kid. I said, it must be from Nebraska because he's smiling. Now, the other part is this passive immunity, and this is what we're going to spend most of our time talking about. And it's interesting, but back in the 1800s and the late 1800s, they knew that there was something in the blood, the plasma, the serum, that in people who got infected and survived, they were protected against infection subsequently. And on the bottom, you see two giants, Emil von Behring, who won the Nobel Prize, and what he did was he developed passive immunity, horse serum against diphtheria toxin. And now we hardly hear about diphtheria, but again, in the 1800s in Germany, which was one of the most civilized nations in the world at that time, and probably had the best medicine, half of the kids before they got to age 15 died from diphtheria. And so the idea that von Bering and Kitasato, both of them, Kitasato isolated the diphtheria toxin, they developed, they injected in horse, and that's why you see horse serum. They injected the horse. They got the serum from it, and they inject it. And we still use horse serum for snake uh, bites. Uh, we use it to kill uh, T cells, and we also use it, uh, we used to use it for hepatitis. So what is the classification of immunity? And this is just a quick overview, but it is both innate and adaptive. What does that mean? Nature has provided us with an automatic response, which is very quick, and this is important. Because if we get exposed to something, we need to be sure we can keep it at bay. And so innate immunity is composed of protein in our body and cells, and they're pre-programmed. So they attack. Anything that comes in, they attack. But it's limited because we don't know what's going to come up new. And this happens all the time. The second part is adaptive immunity. That is, we learn because we get infected we learn about our environment, the things that are in the environment, and our lymphocytes, these are immune cells, program themselves to specifically respond to new things. And that's why, for example, you and I don't have measles, we don't get polio because we've been vaccinated. Influenza is kind of the same. Well, the only reason why we keep getting influenza over and over is because it mutates. Well, make what makes coronavirus different is that we have never been exposed to COVID-19 before, none of us. And that's why we are now having, and we're hoping to eventually develop ad adaptive immunity, vaccines and whatnot, to help us prevent COVID-19. So what do we mean by active immunity? It's previous exposure to bacteria, viruses, toxins, or by vaccinations. So children now get 20, I, Hannah, you have to correct me because I've been so far away from pediatrics. I think kids now get 21 different vaccines. And so this is to protect them by active immunity. And what is active immunity? In general, it's long lived. So if you give polio vaccine, I mean, sorry, if you give tetanus vaccine, in many people, it lasts 40 years. Smallpox vaccine lasted a lifetime. The problem, and this is an important point, is that sometimes when you vaccinate or you get the real infection, the immunity is very partial or it's not long lived. And a good example of that is whooping cough. The second part of it is, of course, passive immunity. And what this is, is we get antibodies, serum, plasma, or gamma globulin, either from animals or from humans. And now we have monoclonals, which we'll talk about. The thing to remember is that this is passive. We're getting something. We're injecting it into you, and it's temporary because our body metabolizes that. So on the bottom, you can see innate immunity, all these different cells that are programmed to attack. You can see in the middle T cells and B cells. T cells attack infected cells. So if viruses get into the cell, the T cell will go after that. B cells, these are B cells that make antibodies. Antibodies float on the outside, so they can't get in the inside. So if the virus comes in and they're floating around in the tissue or outside the cell, the antibody works. But once it gets into the cell, the antibody doesn't work. Okay, so passive immunity, there are three things that I wanna make. And they're all a refinement. It's kind of like you had the telephone, the crank telephone, 
And then we went to the dial telephone and now we got the smartphone. And so this is the same thing. So when we talked about plasma or serum, and interestingly enough, we're talking about convalescent plasma in treating, in treating um, uh, COVID-19. Well, Senchi in 1907, over 110 years ago, used human, uh, human plasma to treat diphtheria. So this is nothing new, but plasma and serum. So plasma is the part that separates the, it's the liquid part from the cells. And then we can now fractionate the plasma. We let it clot and then it becomes serum. And then out of that serum, we get gamma globulin. And gamma globulin makes up only 1% of the serum. So you can see, number one, there's only very little of it in the blood. And number two, it is very, very hard to extract. And we have somebody from Takeda, and we can answer a little bit about that in the question and answer. The immunoglobulin or gamma globulin is polyclonal. What that means is it's against tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of different things. And not only does it go against infectious agents, but it is also against receptors, against mediators, against cytokines, and all of these other things. So it immune modulates and it immune regulates. In fact, most of the gamma globin is not directed against infectious agents. And then finally, we get the smartphone. We have, a, we have one gamma globulin, one IgG, that is geared only to one thing. And this has been one of the major breakthroughs. We use it against infectious agents. We use it against mainly cancer cells, and we use it against reactive proteins. So you've heard about things like Remicade, which is used in inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, rituximab against lymphomas, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really a hundred million miracles from the flower jump song. So again, human and ex uh, animal and human serum early examples, of course, uh, von Behring and Kitasato against uh, diphtheria. We have tetanus immune globulin. We have measles. Uh, gamma globulin was used primarily against measles and hepatitis to prevent Back in the 1930s, they used gamma globulin injections to prevent against pneumonia. Uh, they used gamma globulin to prevent polio, and it was effective uh, against uh, chicken pox and against rabies. We have current examples of hyperimmune globulin. And why do I talk about this? Because now one of the things that we're looking at is making hyperimmune globulin against COVID-19. But we have examples, IVIG, sub-Q, VZIG is hyperimmune, in other words, high titers against chicken pox, high titers against respiratory virus, high titers against CMV, high titers against botulinum, uh, high titers against C. difficile. Uh, we, we were hoping to write a grant to study that because people on gamma globulin tend not to have as many problems with C. difficile as others. We have antibodies, uh, we have special preparations against Ebola. And then monoclonals, we talked a little bit about that, but in infection, they have polizumab, which is against anti-RSV, and now people are trying to make a monoclonal that will attack COVID-19. So looking at IVIG, it is derived from human plasma. It was first used in 1952, I am gamma globin by Bruton. And in 1981, we had the first IV products to use in the United States. It is not only anti-infectious, but it's anti-inflammatory and immune modulating. And it's important to me, for me to talk about this because it sets up what we're gonna talk about in terms of COVID-19. 70% are used by others. It's very safe, no HIV, no hepatitis B, no coronavirus, no mad cow disease. Now the incredible thing, and we have somebody from Takeda who could talk about this perhaps in the Q&A, is that it's a mature product. It's been around for 40 years. And usually 40 years, it becomes obsolete. Well, incredibly, we keep manufacturing more and more of this, and we still cannot produce enough gamma globin that is needed. So here we have, does commercial application to COVID-19, does commercial uh, gamma globin protect against COVID-19? The short answer is we don't know, and Probably not, except for a couple of lots that cross-reacted. This is commercial lots. 
that cross-reacted and neutralized by viral neutralization some of the COVID-19. Most of the commercial products do not interact with COVID-19. So does it protect? No. But if you use high titer IVIG in patients who have severe disease, it might be beneficial, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Is it safe? Absolutely. You cannot get COVID-19 from IgG. We are now looking at hyperimmune anti-COVID IgG. This is convalescent plasma. See how we have come around full circle, where the doctors back in 1890, can you imagine 130 years ago, they were doing the same thing that we're doing now, although we do it on a little more refined but the big area that they're looking at now is they're asking for people who have recovered from uh, COVID-19 to donate their plasma because they want to use convalescent plasma, which may contain antibodies against COVID to treat patients with COVID infection. High dose gamma globulin is anti-inflammatory and it may be beneficial in patients with severe COVID-19 disease. It definitely has been used in cytokine storm, and there it may be beneficial. For example, in toxic necrolysis, epidermal necrolysis, uh, in Kawasaki-like disease, it may be beneficial. Now, one of the things that I know Hannah has, has talked a little bit about this, but it is very difficult to do studies that we would like to do, i.e. double-blind placebo-controlled studies. We can't do that because these are critical situations. But the Chinese have published two papers, or are publishing two papers. The first one is by Xi and others, and they published in the Journal of Infectious Disease. It had 58 cases who were in the ICU, and what they were looking at is survival after two weeks and survival after four weeks. And what they found is that if they gave gamma globulin within 48 hours versus gamma globulin, high dose gamma globulin, after 48 hours, only seven, I hate to say only seven, but only seven who got gamma globulin within 48 hours survived versus 16 who died. So double the number died if they got gamma globulin later. So the question is, is gamma globulin in critically ill patients beneficial? The answer is possible, but we can't do double blind placebo controlled studies right now. I remember I, I, I did my training in Los Angeles where we had gunshot wounds blood pouring all over the place, brains all over the place. I mean, you do everything you can, and these are what these doctors are doing. The second study, again, uncontrolled, but it's a retrospective study. What they did is these were in hospitals. They looked at 325 severe or critically ill patients who were on the ventilator. And we can't see it because it cut off, but I think about 170 uh, received gamma globin, 151 did not. And they looked at one month survival and 60 day survival. And the patient, the critically ill patients on gamma globulin did better with IV IG. So the answer is gamma globulin may play a role. Now this is an area that is exciting. Remember we said plasma was the most crude product because it contained only 1% gamma globulin or less. Then when we went to gamma globulin, it contained antibodies against hundreds of thousands of different things. And here now, we are talking about monoclonals where it's directed against only one thing. So what is the use of IVIG and monoclonals? Possible use in anti-inflammatory disease and passive immunity. Passive immunity, hyperimmune convalescent IgG. I think Takeda and others are working not, on not only on convalescent plasma, but isolating the plasma, separating out the IgG. So this would be hyperimmune anti-coronal antibodies. This would be like varicella zoster, like CMV that I talked to you, like anti-RSV that had very high titers against these viruses. Now the monoclonals, this to me is a very exciting area, and I think Hannah would agree. What happens is those people who recover from COVID, we can get their lymphocytes, we can stimulate them to make antibodies, and we can isolate those individual antibodies that neutralize the COVID-19 virus. And that's important because we make a lot of antibodies against the COVID virus, but it may be directed against structure, it may be directed against membrane, which would not be effective in blocking or disabling the virus. So we, can, we know what neutralizes the virus, 
we can now take these lymphocytes from recovered patients, we can cause them to produce monoclonal antibody, we can take that and we can manufacture that. So that's one exciting part. And Scripps Clinic in San Diego have found that some of the antibodies against SARS also cross-reacts against COVID. So that gives us a jump start. And then finally, monoclonals to block cytokine storm. And I think Hannah may have talked a little bit about this. Anti-IL-6 is very important. They have clinical trials now looking at it. But there are also other anti-cytokinal, anti-inflammatory uh, antibodies that are trying to block monoclonals that block the activity of these. And these are also being studied. So if you look at what causes big problems in, in uh, patients with COVID-19, it appears to be the immune or abnormal or exuberant immune response that is causing a lot of damage in the lungs, in the heart, in the liver, and possibly the kidneys and the blood vessels with thrombosis. So what about the shortages? We said that there was a shortage way back in 2019 and probably before that, there's an increased demand. There's the increase in neurology, transplantation, and other inflammatory diseases. The shortage can result because of contracts. What would you mean by contracts? That is big organizations purchasing a large amount of gamma globulin. And so the smaller hospitals, the smaller uh, institutions or institutions like the university who contract for only one product may not be able to get other products. And also there may be product limitation because of the insurance companies. Will COVID uh, place increased demands for IgG? The question is unknown, but possibly yes. If it is used in patients with cytokine storm and patients with severe lung disease, uh, you can see here, I, I, it's being cut off, but you can see the demand. And if you look, the two slides show that gamma globulin for immune deficiency is really only a small part. On the top slide, you can see the dark purple. The amount or the demand for gamma globulin for PID goes up, but look at the demand for the others. So if you look at the pie-shaped graph on the bottom, for immune deficiency, it, you, it, we have only about 30 to 33%. The rest is being used by others. So the, while we are producing a lot, the demand is outstripping out, out, uh, our ability to produce. So here you can see on the left side, the production, it goes up every year. We're producing tons and tons of gamma globulin, and yet we cannot keep up with the demand and only one liter of plasma. So when people donate, they donate half a liter of plasma. So two people, it takes two people to make four and a half grams. And when a lot of people use 40 grams, so 10 times that amount, you're looking at 20 people giving uh, gamma globulin for, 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 I'm sorry, you're looking at 80 people giving gamma globulin to treat one person. So gamma globulin is very difficult to produce. It takes six months or longer to manufacture, so we can't just crank that thing out. John can talk a little bit more about this, but there has been a push that patients with PID will have uh, priority for the gamma globulin. Safety issues, uh, this was talked about before. What are the chances of uh, corona uh, infection? Well, it increases, it of course increases with contact with others. So in a hospital setting, infusion setting, nurse, uh, home health nursing settings, this is increased useful uh, exposure to others. Self-infusion at home limits. Uh, contacts. You cannot get COVID-19 from IgG or gamma globulin, just like you cannot get AIDS, hepatitis, or mad cow disease. And in my thing, it's cut off again. You can see, uh, I forgot the guy's name, uh, but anyway, he says, I'm being socially isolated, doesn't bother me, and then wash your hands and wear a mask. And this is for Ashley. Ashley, I found out, is Portuguese. I, I come from Hawaii, where there's a lot of Portuguese, so I eat a lot of Portuguese uh, food. Lao Lima in Hawaii means many hands working together in cooperation and harmony. And this is a painting by the great Herb Kane. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kobayashi. 
Now we have, um, before we continue, I would like to welcome and invite Amanda Frainer for a quick word from our sponsor. Okay, okay, it wouldn't let me do it. I'm still trying to figure out the technology. Um, many hands working together. I really like that saying. I feel like uh, as we adjust to all of these new technology ways of connecting, we're, we're all learning from each other and working together. Um, I'm Amanda Frainer. I'm with Horizon Therapeutics. I work on our communications team. I have the privilege of being able to share stories and raise awareness for rare diseases, um, in particular rare PIs uh, like chronic gravulomatous disease. Um, it's a real honor to be able to share stories from people living with CGD, um, to be able to connect to great resources like the ones that the IDF provides, um, and to really be a part of, of helping support that community. Um, being a rare disease, it often feels isolated and alone. I think we're all feeling that way. So I am super impressed by the level of excitement and energy that the IDF has been able to bring to this virtual event. This is my very first virtual event, um, and it's been a lot of enjoyment to participate in the polls, to learn from our experts. Um, I'm very much looking forward to the virtual booth a little bit later and being able to connect with each one of you. Um, I want to thank the IDF for inviting us to be able to say a few words and the presenters for sharing some really great and informative information. Thank you, Amanda. Now, at this time, Dr. Niebuhr and Dr. Kobayashi are going to be answering questions related to COVID-19 and the PI community. Each of our presenters will take turns answering the questions, and because we are um, behind on time, we got a late start, um, Dr. Kobayashi and Dr. Niebuhr, it would be wonderful if you could keep your, your answers as brief as possible so that we can answer as many questions as um, we possibly can. So um, right now, I encourage you to continue sending in your questions through the Q&A via the chat feature. And we have our first question from the audience, which is, does the flu shot or pneumonia vaccine provide any protection against COVID-19 or will the illness be less severe if I get those shots? Dr. Niebuhr, that question's for you. So it is not going to protect you against COVID-19, but it could protect you against getting influenza or getting pneumonia with COVID-19. You know, anytime your lungs are compromised, it does make it easier for you to get more infections. So I do think it is a good idea to stay up to date on all your vaccines, even if it doesn't give you direct protection against COVID-19. Dr. Kobayashi, this question's for you. If I don't make antibodies, what test is the best one for me to get to see if I have COVID-19? So the question is, you, you don't have the ability to make uh, antibodies. And so what they would do is a reverse transcriptase uh, PCR. And what that would be, there are two ways of, you know, two simple ways of seeing whether you have something. And I, I call it the footprints or the direct problem if you have somebody eating your chicken. And the footprint is, the, is our ability to make antibodies. And so there's a test for people who don't have immune deficiency. So after they get the infection, sometime later they will get a serology test, a blood test to see if they make antibodies against COVID and the assumption is they had the infection. The problem is that if you don't make antibodies, then you will not make antibodies, so the blood test will not be helpful. So if you have the infection, they have to get the test to look for virus particles. That's the PCR. We are still doing it. I had two patients that I thought who, ha who have gamma globulin, who are in gamma globulin, profound hypogamma globulinemia, who I thought for sure had COVID-19, and they went to one of the hospitals and the test was negative. But the test can be negative, even though they have the infection. So what we're doing is we're sending the antibody, the viral neutralization antibody test, because they had this over a month ago, 
through the Mayo Clinic, which is doing the viral neutralization test to see if they make antibodies. If, they, if, they, if the test is negative, we don't know. If the test is positive and they are able to make some antibodies, then that'll tell us they had COVID-19. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to invite some of our audience members to ask Dr. Niebuhr a question. And that first question will come from Debbie. Debbie, go ahead, ask your question. There, I'm unmuted, I think. <laughs> Um, my question is, what parameters should I look for in my community to judge when it is safe to expand the places that I go to and the things that I do? That is a really great question. So most people are going by the standard that cases are steadily going down over a two week period. And so as you know, a lot of things are opening up and we're still seeing cases go, the case load go up. It's really not a time to, to relax too much. But what we do today really affects where things are in two weeks, which is why we want to see nice steady decline over two weeks before you start lifting some of those precautions. Thank you. Our next question from the audience is from Peggy. Peggy is also going to ask Dr. Niebuhr her question. Hi, Dr. Niebuhr, thank you. Is it safe to swim in a pool, a lake, a river, or the ocean this summer? It all depends on how many people you are with. You know, pool chlorination should take care of virus neutralization, but if you're at the pool and it's a crowded day, then your greatest, your greater issue is going to be direct spread. You know, as the weather gets warmer, we're expecting that the virus is not going to be able to live on surfaces nearly as long. So if you are going to a lake or a river that is not crowded, it would be reasonable to do that. Your bigger issue is can you is it just you there and just your family there or is it a big crowd of people that you don't know? Thank you. Wow. Thank you for your questions. You all have all continued to send in so many questions that we can't even keep up with you, can't keep typing them, but don't stop because this is fantastic. So in order to keep our Q&A moving and get as many um, questions answered as possible, I'm going to read your questions aloud from the chat box. And um, Dr. Niebuhr and Dr. Kobayashi, I'll just call on you to answer them as we go. Um, Dr. Niebuhr, you're on a roll here. Um, this person says, I have many friends who go out on walks in their neighborhoods without masks, while others are doing the same. Is there a danger by walking through a cloud formed by another breathing person, which they would have found could be, um, you know, um, the, I, I guess the COVID um, would be in the air. So is there a danger to that? COVID is not airborne, so you wouldn't have to worry about walking to, into a cloud where someone has recently been breathing. The bigger problem is if someone is doing something that really um, causes some aerosolization, like sneezing or singing or yelling, then that has some pretty good uh, spread to it, more I would say than six feet. Um, so it all depends. How close are you getting to other people? How, how, um, and if you are getting close to those other people, then maybe a mask would be a good idea. But if you're, but if everyone's staying, you know, at least six feet away and continuing to pass instead of stopping to chat, I don't know that you have to wear a mask just walking around in your neighborhood. Dr. Kobayashi, question for you. Can COVID-19 be spread in a heated therapy pool? Um, I, I think possibly. You know, the, the, the thing is that this, we seem to get it by aerosolization or getting it eyes, nose, and throat. And the idea that heat will kill it 
uh, it, heat may retard its growth, but it does not necessarily protect us against it. I mean, think about it. You know, people who are carrying the virus are 98 degrees or so, or at least 95 or so in their nose and throat. And if they cough or sneeze right on you, I mean, that thing is coming right on. So it depends. My, my, my feeling is you need to be cautious on a number of reasons. Number one, none of the 7 billion people in the world were immune. Number two, this is a highly contagious virus. I mean, you've seen what happens and when we relax our guard, like in Korea and in Germany, where they're starting to relax, and the thing broke out again, this is a concern. My main concern is that we not get too close to people that we don't know and have not been exposed to before. The other thing is you absolutely have to wash your hands. You cannot touch your face because that's how the thing gets in if you're not careful. You can breathe it in or you touch your hands and then you touch your face, your eyes, it gets in through the eyes and nose and the throat, and this is a problem. So I think I would be very cautious, particularly if you're immune deficient. In um, order to keep things moving, Dr. Niebuhr, this is going to be the last question. There are many questions about um, going out as things start opening up. So this question is, as places of employment, schools, and universities reopen, should individuals with PI consult with their immunologist in regards to whether they should take extra precautions? I think that's a great idea to figure, you know, you, a lot of it depends on what precautions the school or the employer are taking. Are they going to give you the accommodations you need to keep yourself safe from getting infections? And it's really the same thought you have to have as you, we open everything up, you know, visiting other family members, visiting friends. Are they willing to do the things to keep you safe? Are they minimizing wherever else they're going? Are they wearing masks when they're going out? And that helps you answer a lot of these questions. You know, if they're not willing to take those precautions to keep you safe, then you need to make your own decisions to do what it takes to keep yourself safe. Thank you. Thank you to both of you. Thank you to, um, at this time, thank you for your, your wonderful um, questions, your wonderful answers to the questions. Thank you, Dr. Niebuhr and Dr. Kobayashi. You are wonderful presenters. We know how challenging of a time this is, and we thank you both so much for your commitment and your support to our community. Um, to all of our participants, thank you for your questions, and please continue to send them in. We will work on getting your questions answered after this event. And now at this time, I would like to invite Kelly Gertz from CSL Bearing for a quick word from our sponsor. Um, first of all, I want to say how lucky we are to have Dr. Niebuhr and Dr. Kobayashi in the Omaha area. You guys are fabulous, and I, um, I'm thrilled that I was able to join the meeting. I learned a lot from you guys, so thank you. Thank you to our community. Um, also, I just wanted to say um, I'm sad that we're not in person. This is my seventh year of attending with CSL Bearing, and I love meeting all of you guys and hearing your stories. So what I do want to say, and hopefully you can join the chat room after this, CSL Bearing with Hyzentra and Privagen. Um, we are thinking of all of you. Um, we're here to support you, your, your patients, um, Dr. Niebuhr, Dr. Kobayashi, all of your patients, we're here to support you. So please um, just remember, you can always go to um, hyzentra.com and that shows all of our resources that are available, our sample program, our copay card, um, we have an assurance program, we have voice-to-voice -voice advocates. Um, we also currently have um, patient webinars going on that you can join from your home. Um, so please uh, go to hyzentra.com. Also, you can go to IGIQ and in the breakout, I'll give you all that information. So um, just know we are here to support you and I hope everyone continues to be healthy. So that's it, thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Now I'm going to hand it over to John for closing remarks before our virtual exhibit hall. Great. Well, thank you, Kathy. And uh, thank you once again, uh, both to, uh, to Dr. Niebuhr and to Dr. Kobayashi 
uh, uh, your time, your expertise, uh, you know, it, it is uh, so needed, so appreciated, and we're really, really grateful to, to have you as, uh, as friends and partners in uh, making sure that our uh, community is uh, informed as it should be. Uh, so uh, before we continue on to the virtual exhibit hall, and just so everyone you know, knows, we, this is not done yet. We've had some presentation, we've had uh, uh, some Q&A, but uh, uh, things are not done. Um, I did, I did want to, uh, since Dr. Kobayashi uh, uh, mentioned uh, the issue and, and suggested that I uh, address it a little bit, uh, Yes, over uh, uh, basically an 18 month period or so, uh, there were a lot of disruptions and a lot of uh, folks were having uh, trouble uh, accessing immunoglobulin. Certainly not everyone, but you know, a decent number. Uh, first with subcutaneous and then with IVIG. Uh, and that really was uh, by and large a supply chain issue where uh, the needs in certain areas uh, basically pulled it away from kind of the traditional uh, distribution of immunoglobulin. Uh, and really about six months ago, uh, we really started to see that taper off and there's, uh, there's precious few reports that we get or the FDA gets or uh, anyone is at this point uh, in terms of people having an issue accessing their immunoglobulin. So the uh, shortage, uh, as you know, uh, some of us referred to it, or the, the the issues, you know, by and large were were really dealt with. But as Dr. Kobayashi said, you know, there is always a possibility of something more down the road uh, because, of course, it's dependent upon people continuing to donate uh, at plasma centers, and because of social distancing, you know, there there has been a little bit of fear about could that impact things six to nine months down the road, when of course that plasma would be turned into uh, finished immunoglobulin products. Uh, IDF is in contact with all the manufacturers, all the collectors uh, regularly. Uh, thus far, you know, uh, except there are long lines and waits and things like that, it, it's uh, kind of logistically impacted uh, seemingly to a small degree uh, there. We're not seeing or hearing anything that makes us uh, concerned about what we're going to be experiencing you know, nine-ish months down the uh, road, but because there's different, different municipalities, uh, you know, involved, uh, even though the Department of Homeland Security has said that these collection centers uh, are an essential uh, uh, service, you know, that we're all just kind of keeping an eye on it. So in case something changes radically uh, across the nation, you know, we will be ready to jump in. But again, you know, what some people experienced, uh, you know, over the last year and a half or so, uh, we're not expecting it to happen again, but we are always on our guard. So with that one uh, little question that came my way, um, let me just uh, go and uh, do a little quick uh, commercial for IDF and then we'll uh, break out. Uh, you know, we have, as I uh, said before, a lot of great uh, resources online. We have a lot of great publications uh, that are, um, of course, uh, available for download uh, on uh, primaryimmune.org. Uh, and a lot of them are very specified to talking with your children, uh, helping them to understand the immune system, uh, you know, things for uh, uh, some specific diagnoses. But one of the things I did want to point out is our patient and family handbook. Uh, a new edition was released a few months ago. Uh, and especially if you're new to our community, please go and download it. Uh, and then of course, once everyone in IDF is back in the office again, we'll be happy to send you a hard copy of it. Uh, but uh, it really is an amazing resource. Uh, but while after you have done uh, reading the hundreds of pages of the patient family handbook, uh, you might find that you need some additional support. And so I wanna make sure that everyone knows that IDF has a, a whole host of different support programs uh, that are really meant for one-on-one uh, -on -one interaction with, with people who get it. So one-on-one uh, -on -one peer support, uh, the local Get Connected groups, uh, you know, where uh, they're, they're a group of people who kind of live in a general area, um, you know, who are just connecting and, you know, meeting every month or two uh, now online uh, to provide support, uh, to provide uh, information, and to just go from there. Uh, because, again, you know, most people don't really understand what it is that we're going through, but we do have a whole big network of people uh, who do get it. And uh, if we are able to, um, uh, to, to see one another, to talk with one another, 
it really helps with the issues of isolation. It really helps to understand, uh, you know, uh, different points of view. Uh, those who are newer uh, uh, in, the, in the diagnosis uh, can learn from those who have been, uh, you know, down this path before. And so, uh, you know, with that sort of importance of one-on-one -on -one interaction, and, and I would argue seeing each other, um, you know, in uh, a few moments, we are going to go and break out into uh, uh, some little groups here. Uh, and so I would suggest that uh, when that happens, that you do uh, maybe consider turning on your camera. It really is lovely to see faces uh, of those who, um, uh, those people who do get it. Um, and in terms of getting it, uh, if there's something that you don't get, uh, feel free to uh, go to uh, Ask IDF. Uh, we, we're only able to get to some of your questions today. If there is something that we did not get to, uh, you know, we will try to uh, put it into blog posts and all that. But if you have a real one-on-one -on -one question and you uh, need a member of our team to help you with it, uh, please do uh, uh, shoot us a line. Uh, uh, go to primaryimmune.org slash ask-idf, or you can just leave us voicemail and one of us will get back to you as soon as we can. Uh, and then, of course, there'll be other opportunities to do other virtual events like this later on. Um, and so uh, with that, uh, we are just about ready to start transitioning. And so I do want to uh, thank uh, our sponsors uh, once again for helping to make this and a lot of our other programming uh, uh, possible. Uh, and so really for all of you, uh, we're just so grateful that you are part of this. Uh, we hope it uh, gave you uh, a couple of things to chew on, maybe some information you didn't have previously, um, you know, at our, our Presenters are so phenomenal, but then again, you are too uh, for taking the effort to learn, uh, to uh, and, and hopefully to take what you've learned and to spread it, that information, to other zebras you may be in contact with um, and other people in your community who maybe uh, are, are not as attuned to what's going on uh, with people with rare diseases and uh, you know the issues surrounding plasma, social distancing, uh, you know, and what it is that we need to do to keep each other safe. So um, we hope that you've enjoyed this. And if you want more, uh, we're going to have uh, another one of these. We'll have some COVID and some other uh, information uh, as well uh, next Thursday. Uh, so May the uh, 21st. So uh, some of you, we hope to see you there. And if not, well, guess what? We're going to have uh, these going on pretty much every week, uh, give or take, uh, uh, ad infinitum. So uh, I hope that everyone uh, has a great night. Uh, go get dinner if you haven't. Uh, go uh, uh, feed the cat. Uh, some of you saw my face changing. The cat was loving on me for a moment and then was not loving on me because I'm invading her space. So uh, let's go deal with the things that we have to deal with in quarantine um, and uh, just be safe, be sane, take care of yourselves, take care of those around you and we will see you next time. Thanks guys, be well.